Welcome back. Um, our next speaker in the, the series is uh, Marilyn Brown. So Marilyn is a it's Douglas. Not on. It's not on. Yes. Okay. Marilyn is a graduate of Douglas College, and then she went on to uh, Ohio State University, where she got her PhD. And then for 23 years, mm -hmm. was at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which uh, very similar career paths to what I did at Berkeley National. And now she's at Georgia Institute of Technology, and uh, we invited Marilyn to come back and revisit after these years. Um, talk about public policy uh, in, in the aspects of the energy environment and public policy. So uh, without further ado, Much 
less energy each of those industries could consume, and there is diversity. But for the most part, you can certainly see that that blue band is, is large. Um, another way to look at the magnitude of the energy efficiency potential <coughs> is by looking at how much energy we consume per dollar of uh, productive production from manufacturing relative to other countries. So this shows you over time the energy intensity of our manufacturing relative to other countries. So you can see how dramatically, for instance, China has brought down its energy consumption. And the United States did uh, for a while, the US being in gold, uh, but it's really remained quite flat for several decades, suggesting you know, it's not keeping up with the advances that science and technology would suggest are possible. Um, another way to try to convince um, you that there is an efficiency opportunity is to look at what some of the leaders in industry are doing. What Dow, DuPont, PepsiCo, and, and Toyota, for instance, have done over the past uh, several years. Dow, for instance, saving $8.6 billion in energy from energy efficiency strategies globally, and DuPont of a similar magnitude, $2 billion. A PepsiCo, another leader, Toyota, saving $9 million in energy costs over the past 10 years. So clearly, people are companies uh, that are paying attention can do it. These uh, quotes, by the way, come from a, a great report by Bill Prindle called From the uh, Shop Floor to the Top Floor, you know, suggesting you need to really get that CEO inspired for some of these changes to occur. Now, I showed you a graph that um, documented the significant downturn in energy consumption by China, but the fairly flat or uh, more modest improvements by the U.S. and other countries. Well, it's, that's a very aggregate way of looking at the opportunity. As you know, we have lost a lot of our energy intensive jobs to offshore uh, companies, offshore countries. And what you really need to do is look specifically at individual industries, because as a whole, our industrial activities have moved to the information intensive and less energy intensive uh, sectors of the economy. So take these individual industries and look and see how their energy intensity has changed over time. And if you look at this chart, which, which uh, is based on the Manufacturing Energy Consumption Survey that DOE conducts every few years, starting in 77 and going to the latest next to latest one, 2004, you can see, again, a great deal of inertia. The best performer in terms of reducing energy intensity being the petroleum industry uh, and, and other industries really being quite flat and showing little progress. So finally, in this sort of uh, theme of <laughs> can we do better, uh, take a look at some of the technologies and the innovations that are available now to industry and ask the questions which ones are being used and do an inventory. You'll see there are so many um, uh, opportunities for improvement if you look at the nano, info, bio technologies that have come online. Sensors control molecular level control of catalytic materials, super durable materials, being able to run Combustion process is hotter and therefore more energy efficient, requires more durable materials that don't corrode. And all of these have uh, been advanced by our laboratory scientists, uh, but they haven't been taken up on a regular basis sufficiently by manufacturing. One of those I want to talk about in particular, just as an illustration, is the uh, ability to recover and use waste heat. This is one of my favorite topics. Um, the topic of waste utilization usually is discussed in parallel with this concept of a paradigm shift in power production. How on the left side, today's power plants, mostly central generation, large scale, maybe 300 natural gas combined cycle plant, a gigawatt of nuclear coal thrown in, you, you produce it at the power plant and you wheel it and you uh, distribute it to your customers, and at that, uh, with that kind of a system, you're talking about, well, 
30 some percent efficiency in getting the power to the customer, and then you add that compact, then you add that incandescent bulb, like I had in my hotel room last night, Paul. <laughs> You're down to using electricity at one to two percent efficiency. Um, but if you shift to this more distributed power, uh, generation and consumption opportunity, you're putting the power generation near to uses of the waste heat so that you're not losing more uh, energy than you're putting to productive use. And uh, this, one of the systems that I in particular like is, is this combined heat and power because it's so appropriate for the industrial sector. So rather than having a boiler are running at maybe 90 percent and a power plant from which you purchase your electricity. Instead, you have a combined heat and power system which operates at 75 to 80 percent efficient instead of the 45 to 50 percent efficient. So now we move into the realm of why isn't this being done and why aren't some of these innovations being picked up? And I would argue in each case you need to figure out what the barriers and drivers are in order to understand what policies might motivate change. So when you look at CHP, lots of barriers, barriers lots of drivers. Uh, one of the barriers in this case is of being a policy, a public policy that's interfering with the optimization of energy use in the industrial system. So in this case, states set emission standards, and most states, 42 states out of our 50, have what we call input-based emission standards. Now, it's my understanding that these emerged back uh, 30, 23, 20, or 30 years ago when there wasn't sufficient data about the emissions of individual processes. And you couldn't have an output-based emission standard. There wasn't enough understanding. You knew the energy, you knew the um, resources, the amount of coal, natural gas, and petroleum being burned in the process, but you didn't understand the industrial system well enough to give credit for a high efficiency system. Well, in this case, imagine you have a manufacturer in the top diagram, and they are um, qualified through the EPA emissions, um, input emissions standard, because they are only uh, producing 0.09 pounds, let's say, of NOx per million BTU. Now, it turns out that they're actually generating 95 tons a year, but that's because they're highly inefficient, but that doesn't, um, that's not taken into account. The plant down uh, on the second drawing is the plant as now designed with a combined heat and power system. Now, you see their uh, emissions, input emissions are higher. They're running this plant hotter. The more NOx is created, they're disqualified. If they design the plant this way, they are at risk of a violation of their operating permit. So number one, do they want to take the risk and even explore the opportunity to make the change? Or two, would it even be possible within a state that didn't have an output-based emission standard? The total uh, tons of emissions for the CHP plant is far less, because um, they're generating both uh, electricity and and heat. This is just an example of one case uh, yet to be converted to a CHP system that um, Tom Caston is working on, maybe a name some of you know. Um, this is a one of the world's largest silicon manufacturers that uh, produces silicon in an electric arc furnace 24-7. It's one of those great loads. I wish that, uh, um, is his name Ralph Izzo? Izzo, yeah. Izzo. Izzo. You know, it's the opposite of that residential customer. This customer is running all the time, nonstop. But um, it's venting its uh, heat in these hairpin dryers right here. There's no waste heat capture. There's no recycling of the thermal energy. And so the proposal is to install the waste heat recovery equipment that would be needed. But they're up against all kinds of, of barriers and issues. So understanding the issues helps understand why industry is not investing more. Understanding the drivers for these investments help you to identify policies that might be able to take hold. Um, you know, including the fact that uh, demand charges and demand response incentives can make a difference. And in the case of CHP, valuing the um, power reliability 
comes from having a distributed source of electricity generation, sometimes located in parts of the grid that are otherwise unstable. Um, one of the things that I, another uh, role that I play is I was uh, nominated by President Obama to the Board of Directors of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the country's largest public power provider. And we are looking, as a result, very hard at trying to identify the reliability benefits of distributed generators. Well, we have seven policies we're looking at. We've divided them into three types. Several of them are those that deal with regulations, like this output-based emission standard, trying to get it taken hold, taking hold in states across the country, renewable um, energy uh, portfolio standards. In the center, the green policies are those that provide technical assistance and uh, workforce training, such as the uh, types of activities that you at Rutgers University do in the Industrial Assessment Center um, that you run here. One of the country's best, Mike Muller, is in charge there. So small firm energy management, too. All of the federal programs seem to overlook the smaller firms. Uh, difficult to reach out to them. We need to find a way to do that. And then in the bottom rim, we've got a, a couple of um, subsidies, including or financing approaches, including tax lien financing. That's the use of PACE, property assessment, clean energy. That's where a municipality levies a bond and provides financing to help their manufacturers upgrade <coughs> to better energy efficiency practices. Who's got more at stake? than that city or county, which is provided uh, with all the workers being uh, supported by that effort. I'm not going to bore you with the benefit cost calculations, just uh, wanted to tell you we're using the National Energy Modeling System and running through all kinds of sensitivities and on almost every approach to evaluating the benefits and costs, these types of policies are highly cost effective. Just a few more slides, two more slides. Um, I didn't want to um, overlook the fact that you get a double dividend if you develop highly efficient methods of manufacturing green and clean products. As you know, um, corporate responsibility today has been expanded to a much broader view of energy and environmental sustainability. Companies now are considering the nature of the products and services that they're offering, not just how they're producing those products. And they're also putting an emphasis on green and clean uh, supply chain activities. They're able to move much of the market through their buying habits. So corporate sustainability, big motivator. And it's driving more investment into the kinds of um, products that we're talking about here today, fuel cells and biofuels and new, uh, new photovoltaic systems. Uh, one of the reasons that you get so much of an uptick in jobs from investing in energy efficiency in industry is not just because you're now able to develop new industries, which is so important in today's competitive marketplace, to recapture some of that international uh, demand for goods and services, but also because you get a much bigger labor force, workforce payback to investing in efficiency relative to investing in, say, three new power plants in the state of New Jersey. Um, the average investment to the average million dollars in a new power plant after you've constructed it is four jobs per million dollars of investment. Let's see if we can find that in this chart. Okay, the uh, electricity, I'm sorry, I'm lying. Um, in the south, where I did these calculations, the number is 5.6. For natural gas, um, now that's uh, the average coal for, um, I'm sorry, that is the average for all of the electricity produced in 17 states in the south. 5.6 jobs per million, uh, million investment. For natural gas, 
That is, if you were to heat your home with natural gas, you would be uh, supporting 8.4 jobs per million in, in, of purchase of that natural gas. So, so we see those numbers are pretty modest relative to construction and energy efficiency equipment, such as the purchase of new motors and new uh, industrial systems, which generate on average 16 jobs per million dollars invested. So you see that energy efficiency is so much more labor intensive than what could be more important in today's economy than moving from power production and energy consumption to energy efficiency and upgrading through investments in, in a more better equipment. So the energy efficiency gap is large. We looked at that from five or six different perspectives. Policies could help motivate businesses to invest more in energy efficiency, preserving jobs in existing industries. And advanced product innovation can be enabled through better, um, more energy efficient plants and the generation of those. Both approaches are key to sustaining a vibrant industrial base. And thank you very much.
problem of uh, electric interference, and there's stability of the system, and by the time you're done, you're so exhausted and the whole thing falls apart. And lots of examples of that. So it's another, another case where policy has interfered with the, the right solution. Um, comparisons to other examples where uh, these kinds of savings have been realized would be a real useful metric rather than forecast based upon uh, models, let's say. So we know uh, in, the, in the world, of course, uh, that Germany has invested enormously in uh, green and, and renewable uh, energy resources, at least for 15 plus years. And I'm just curious whether or not there are any uh, lessons that we could take away from that that would reassure industrial people who want to make a difference could actually say, well, it does work under this scenario. So what did we learn? Yeah, Japan and Denmark also would be two good uh, countries to turn to. Uh, Denmark is 60% distributed electricity now. And Japan's uh, cogeneration system is vying for it's a, it's the enormous uh, undertaking now in terms of meeting electricity needs of the, of the Japanese. Um, in uh, economy. Now, Denmark is able to use all of the European Union's um, gas and other power production to stabilize it. So it has something of an advantage that perhaps some places in the U.S. might not. That is, you, you know, they. Um, but uh, yeah, they're. Then there are states that are doing it well. So I think there are lessons that can be learned. In my opinion, and half of the problem is not persuading the industrial um, companies to go forward. It's to persuade the uh, electric industry to work with them to wield the power on their own system, to, to purchase the power if there's an excess, there's quite a, they, the pulp and paper industry is considering re-optimizing its um, production to maximize electricity production and have pulp and paper as a secondary byproduct. <laughs> I mean, there's a, there's a little bit of exaggeration, but I've talked to several of uh, the companies that would like to, to sell you more electricity. They can produce it. They've got the feedstock. But the power company won't buy it because they say of what it costs per kilowatt hour in their territory is 2.9 cents. And if you can't generate it and sell it for 2.9 cents, they're not interested. But, I mean, I don't buy my power for 2.9 cents a kilowatt hour. So. In one of your initial slides, you, sh you show a pie chart that compares the industrial sector to the uh, commercial, residential, and transportation sectors. But can you uh, enlighten us as to how much of the industrial sector consumption is related to building, operation, and maintenance? I can. Um, 